We continue macroeconomics, uh, lecture seven. We are uh, on the topic of money debasement or debasement of money. So to debase, to debase means to lower the value of something and specifically of money. Uh, for money has two different meanings. The Interpret, the, one of the interpretations is that we add a base metal to the precious metal. How does it work? Well, here is a coin and here is a, another coin. So, the king grabs half of the precious metal of the coin and the other half from the other coin. So, from this one, he makes one coin. From this part, he makes a second coin. From the third part, he makes a third coin. And then a fourth coin. So, from two coins, the king, it could be the knight, it could be uh, whatever, modern government, makes from two coins of a given size and purity, he makes four coins of the same size, the same weight, but half the purity. If this coin here had a 90% purity, these coins will have a 45% purity. How does it work when the king or whoever is in charge of money? He will get the coins is usually a payment of taxes. He will melt them and issue four coins. When he issues four coins, what happens is he will return these two back into circulation and these two act as a, if you want to call it gain, if you want to call it uh, profit. Of course, it's not a commercial enterprise to be properly called profit, but Ultimately, it is his benefit. This is one of the major, one of the major, or let's call it the primary reason that the government or whoever is in charge of the country always monopolizes the issue of money. So, if I can monopolize the issue of money, this means that for me, whatever I issue is a pure benefit or a pure gain. Of course, these, the value of each is lowered and what really happens down the road is as more and more coins begin to circulate and the number, the quantity of coins begins to increase relative to, good, to relative to goods and services. The only thing that can happen ultimately within a relatively short period of time, sometimes six months, sometimes up to two years, is that prices will rise correspondingly to, uh, to incorporate or to factor in the increased money supply. All right, so that was on debasement. Uh, what was then the next topic? What does it say? Okay, supply of money, supply of money. So we have the last topic of this chapter uh, to finish is supply of money. All right, supply of money is simply the sum of everyone's holding. So. First of all, money, supply is also known, at least back in the old days, as money stock. Money stock. Stock is the same thing as stock variable and flow variable. It simply tells you that Money supply is a stock variable. This means that at this second, there is one money supply. One hour later, there is a money supply. Maybe the same, maybe different. Uh, next 
day, tomorrow there will be yet another money supply. So the money supply is, for example, the money supply in this room will be uh, number of Levy in my wallet plus the number of Levy in his wallet and her wallet and etc. So we add up everyone's money's holding. So you have what's called money. Oops, guys, let me try to do this again. Money holding which is the same as money balance or money balances. So money balance is simply the amount of money that one person has at his disposal at one particular time. So money supply, so Money supply is equal by definition of the sum, the total sum of money balances. So when you add up everybody's money's balance, you simply get the total money supply. Now, I use the keyword total, so we can say <coughs> total money supply, but in economics, economists prefer a different word. They prefer the word aggregate. So economists like to use the word aggregate. So sometimes we say total money supply, sometimes we just say aggregate money supply, sometimes we just say money supply. Later I may discuss narrow money supply, broad money supply, uh, money multiplier. These are topics that might be will, will be coming uh, later. So money balances. Here is one key point to understand about money. Money doesn't float and money doesn't circulate. This is mis misperception or misconception. Money is always, at any point in time, owned by somebody. I always like saying, if you know some money which is not owned by anybody, please let me know. I'm going to go and get it and maybe share some with you. So, the point is, money is always owned by somebody, which means money is always in someone's money balance. That's number one. And the second point to understand is money doesn't float around. That's way too abstract. My money sits in my wallet. When I make a purchase, maybe for a second, I exchange the service with the money, the money immediately changes its owner and then the money will sit in his or her wallet possibly for days, possibly for weeks or even months. So money just doesn't float around. Money always sits in someone's balance. That's simple as that. Alright, this is good enough. All right, so now we move on to the next chapter, which is money demand and money supply. If you remember, I told you early on, I'm skipping uh, a big chunk of the microeconomics. As we get along, I will be covering these micro topics. Well, this is a complete chapter, which essentially reviews supply and demand, which is uh, entirely microeconomics. So we'll make a quick review today with money supply and money demand. Economists will always like to begin with a standard chart. Here we have a quantity, here we have a price. So we have a relationship between price and quantity, that of demand that of demand. We like to draw demand as a downward sloping curve. So here is number one. This one may be a 
curve, or it may be a line, as in a straight line. Some economists like to use a curve, other economists prefer to use a pure straight line. Uh, it doesn't really matter. That's not what is important. What is important is that, number one, we call this DD, and DD we call this a demand curve. Another term that economists like to use instead of demand curve is demand schedule. And the most important property of the demand schedule is that it is always <laughs> downward, downward sloping. In other words, it goes down. What is the meaning of downward sloping? The meaning is very simple. As the price goes down, so you have a particular demand. As the price goes down, the demand increases. And here is the key. This is very important terminology. I used currently the terminology incorrectly. We, use, we call this point here, not demand, we call it quantity demanded. Quantity demanded. And we call this point here again quantity demanded. So, we in economics reserve the word demand to mean the same as demand curve. So, when we say demand, we do mean the whole curve altogether. That's it. So, when you say demand, the whole curve. When we mean any particular point of the demand curve or on the demand curve, we call it quantity demanded. So the correct statement becomes as the price goes down, the quantity demanded increases. Oh, here is one other thing. This is valid only when what? Huh? On the free market? No, we call it the assumption from the first uh, from the first lecture. Citrus paribus. In other words, this means that this demand curve is downward sloping only when other things are equal. Of these, the most important of uh, these is the income. So you must understand that demand or quantity demand increases when the price goes down. When income is, how do I write this? You write this as constant. When income is constant, moreover, constant by definition, we hold it constant. So. Why would that be? Well, one very simple explanation is that uh, if we just have two goods and the good of one price goes down, our purchasing power, meaning the purchasing power of our income increases. And the purchasing power of other people's income increases. So if the purchasing power of my income increases, I am very likely to buy more of that good. Again, even if I might not buy more of that particular good, maybe some other person will buy more. So this refers more to aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Because we have many goods in microeconomics, we have many goods for which just because my income went up doesn't mean I'm going to consume 
more of that good. I mean, we call these goods inferior goods. As my income goes up, I'll actually consume less of them. The classical examples in microeconomics, well, one that comes to my mind is sugar and honey. Sugar is relatively inferior and honey is much superior from health point and any other point of view. So as people's incomes increase, they switch and reduce their sugar consumption and increase their honey. I mean, it could be for any other goods, one of them relatively inferior and another one superior. But for aggregate demand, we do see overall increase. That's because in society there are always sufficiently many relatively poor people that will get in some more that will get in get in some more sugar as sugar prices increase sorry decrease all right so this is a general relationship now downward sloping has a special name in economics it is called the law of demand. So the law of demand stipulates that when incomes are fixed, that's the key, when incomes are fixed, as prices go down, the quantity demanded always increases. Okay? Remember, with inferior goods, that might happen, you know, with the income and income effects and other stuff. I don't want to get into income substitution effects and all this stuff. So, this is called the law of demand. All right. So, the next important concept from microeconomics is that when we move here, we call this, let's say, Q1 and we call this Q2. The move from Q1 to Q2 we call movement along the demand curve. A movement along the demand curve. Remember, demand did not change. Only the quantity demanded changed due to a fall in prices. So we got to put in here uh, P1 and P2, and then we can have here Q1 and have here Q2. Again, the key to all of this is that income remains the same. All right, is anything else? Any other questions? Now, the next topic out of demand is shift in the demand curve. Demand curve shifts. When the demand curve shifts, it means that for every single price, the quantity demanded changes. For example, if it shifts sometimes, we actually have three words here. Sometimes we call it when it shifts to the right. Sometimes we might call it it shifts upward. And sometimes it is called it shifts outward. So when for every single price the quantity demanded increases, we call that demand which is synonymous as demand curve, so we can say demand shifts upward. However, we may also say, and it is identical, there is no different meaning to say shifts to the right, or sometimes rightward. And let's use this word. And sometimes economists will say that demand shifts outward. In other words, it shifts out. What does it mean out? It means 
away from the center. So, this arrow upward represents shift upward, this represents shift to the right or rightward, and this arrow represents uh, the outward shift. So, why demand may shift? What might be a reason for a shift in demand? Increasing income. Increasing income, sure. But, suppose income doesn't increase. Why might that be? Well, uh, change in tastes. Yes, change in tastes. So, it may shift because of changing tastes. Tastes. In economics, we also use a different word for tastes. We also call it preferences. Changing preferences. So, people's preferences change. Uh, also, it may be related to changing tastes and preferences, perceptions. Suddenly, people realize that sugar is absolutely terrible for your health, so they switch to, you know, honey. Or suddenly they realize that cigarettes are so bad and terrible, maybe the media made some, you know, big case, whatever. So, in this particular case, the shift for cigarettes, demand cigarettes, will be leftward or downward. In other words, the demand will drop. Sometimes we just say the demand here increases. So demand increases, that's what we say when the quantity demanded for any price increases. Is there any other reason why demand might increase? Shift in the price of complementary goods. Oh, shift in the price of complementary goods. So, for example, if coffee price quadruples, we'll get to drink less coffee just because it's a lot more expensive. And we decide if we're going to be using or most of sugar's price is associated or a complement of coffee, we might lower our sugar consumption. Say, well, we can switch to tea and tea and whatnot. But in general, the logical goes is a change in price or preference of a complementary. Good. And similarly will be with a substitute. Substitute. Uh, for example, personally, I do not have a strong preference for Coke over Pepsi, neither for Pepsi over Coke. So, in this sense, I'm fairly price sensitive. Whichever is cheaper, I will not hesitate, simply because I don't care, okay? So, that will be an example. So, if Coke or Pepsi decides to slash its price in half, even for a week, I'd be more than happy to drink Pepsi all week long, as an example. So, these are some examples as to why uh, demand may possibly shift besides uh, changing income. All right, so that's on demand, right? Let's move on to supply. Supply is relatively tricky. to discuss and the reason is that sometimes you see supply to be vertical vertical supply it simply means no matter what the price suppliers will supply the given quantity this is considered to be true and correct in economics in what is known as the very short term, very short term.
In this particular case, we say that the supply is inelastic. Inelastic. The way I think about inelastic is that no matter how much the price changes, suppliers cannot change the quantity supply. So you may offer twice the price, but suppliers can't increase their supply. Example today may possibly be uh, crude oil. Whether crude oil is now today $94 or $150, uh, oil exporting companies just can't pump more out of it because they are what's called past peak oil. In other words, they still have plenty of oils, hundreds of billions of barrels of oil, but they don't have the capacity to pump more of it in one day. They can basically pump 87 uh, or so billion, sorry, million barrels a day. You ask them to pump two million more, well, they don't have the capacity. There aren't machines, there aren't plot lines, there, there is no infrastructure. It's just, there is no pressure supply underneath. So no matter what it happens, they can't increase it, all right? So that's one example. Uh, so example of vertical supply is usually associated with something which requires extensive infrastructure in a long period of time to increase supply. I mean, such example will be, let's say, wheat. Wheat, it takes a whole year to plant it and do all the thing about it to get a lot more to a uh, response in higher price. So that's the very short term. However, in the short term, in the short term, most economists will agree, and there is a general consensus that the supply curve is upward sloping. The supply curve is upward sloping. This simply means that as the price of wheat increases, with a some meaningful lag, maybe six months, maybe a year, uh, Farmers will farm more and ultimately get out more wheat on the uh, market, similarly with corn and other stuff. So in the short term, maybe three, six, nine months, again, it depends on the particular response of the particular uh, industry. They will increase substantially the supply whenever the price goes up. So, finally, we have the long term. And the long term, the supply curve, some economists say that is very, very flat. They call it flattish. And some just say that it's plain horizontal. Again, it depends how you think about it. But for most of the economics, it is just fine to assume that it's upward sloping and you can do 99.9% .9 of your analysis with upward sloping supply curves and downward sloping demand curves. So, the upward slope of the supply curve is simply called the law of supply. Law of Supply. So the law of supply states that as price increases, suppliers will supply, and here's the key word, eventually, maybe not today, but maybe a week from today, maybe six months from today, suppliers will eventually supply more. Again, uh, Always the great example to think about because it's the most rich of all examples in economics is uh, crude oil. Well, over the last three years, uh, crude oil prices have gone up from sixty to seventy dollars, and then to eighty dollars, and then on January second this year, uh, crude oil prices went up to hundred dollars, and yet. OPEC has not increased its supply. 
Well, uh, again, it's a discussion. Is it a cartel? Are they just holding out their supply? Or they're not capable of pumping more? All right, so it's a complicated topic, but you got to think about it. Also, when in the law of supply, just because the price rises does not necessarily mean that eventually supply will rise. Again, if we have inflation, all right, if we have inflation, so we we'll always have to think in real terms or price adjusted terms, all right? So that's the law of supply. Well, I don't have anything on that topic. And finally, we get to the cross, crossing of demand and supply. So, you have a basic demand curve and you have a supply curve. The demand curve we usually denote by DD. We always have the same axis, quantity and price. Supply curve is S, S. And first and foremost, this point here, where demand curve and supply curve intersect, that's how we call it. We call this intersection, in other words, where they cross each other, we call this the equilibrium. Equilibrium. So, equilibrium simply means that demand equals supply. Do you have a question? Or? Okay, so, demand equals Actually, I do have a question. Okay, let's see. Does that mean that quantity demand equals quantity supply, demand demand equals supply? Yes, that's the better interpretation. Quite correct. It means that at the given price, so equilibrium, at the given price, quantity demanded equals quantity supply. So, what you have to remember that equilibrium is a state where which includes a price which we denote prefer to denote with a price star so we put in here a special star and quantity so for equilibrium we say that equilibrium exists at such a price where quantity demanded and quantity supplied at that price equal each other. Of course, demand and supply can never possibly be the same. They have different slopes. In other words, demand equals supply only when, only when the two curves are identical, one on top of another. So, essentially in economics, we say for short, for convenience, where demand equals supply. But this is impossible. When we say demand equals supply, it always means when quantity demanded equals quantity supply at the given price. We call this price the equilibrium price. So the price P star is called the equilibrium price. So the equilibrium price is that price at which quantity demanded equals quantity supply. And then you have the equilibrium quantity. So the equilibrium quantity, now we can say, is that quantity for which the price for the demand and the price for the supply are the same. But we don't usually think in the quantity term, we like to think in the price terms, all right? So, Demand, supply. All right, so now we move on to the next uh, issue, which is called the law of supply and 
demand. So, the law of supply and demand simply says that if for any reason whatsoever the market is out of equilibrium, meaning produces a different quantity or is at different price, the price and the quantity will adjust to the equilibrium price and quantity. All right, so suppose the initial price P prime or P1 is here. The quantity demanded is this point. The quantity supply is that point. There is a difference between quantity demanded and quantity supplied. Let's try to do some elementary writing here. So, for P1, we have that uh, supply, quantity supplied at 1 is greater than uh, quantity demanded at I. And we call the difference how? Surplus. Yes, we call it surplus or excess supply. So, excess supply, which in Old English is by common people understood to be surplus, and economists do use it often also as surplus. Now, let's try to do P2, and you have again here at P2, demand at price 2 is greater than supply at price 2. And we have shortage. The shortage is known better in economics as excess demand. In other words, at the given price, quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied, and we call this shortage. What is the most important lesson about shortages? Anybody? What is the required condition for shortages? It's only one and one way. No, no, that's not the condition for a shortage. It's usually a result of a shortage. Hmm? No, all right. Shortages can exist only when the price is fixed. Only when there is price fixing, there is a possibility. There is no other possibility. Every time someone tells you there is a shortage of something, the question is, how is the price fixed? Or who is fixing the price? Or why someone is fixing the price? Yes. Hmm? The government put like yes, okay, well it could be price ceilings. Yes, they may want to put price ceilings for some reason. But what is important to understand is that uh, journalists love this. They love to talk about shortages when in the market there is no shortage. Now, though just recently, we're talking about shortages of wheat because wheat prices went up. Well, is there any shortage of wheat? The answer is no. Nobody fixed the price. There is a price currently. If you go pay the price, anyone can get as much as they want at that market price. So, journalists very often confuse the, uh, the word shortage with scarce or scarcer. So, just because the wheat price went during the year of 2007 more than twice up, meaning price went up twice, Jim is talking constantly about shortages of wheat. There is no wheat shortage. 
We got a whole lot scarcer. I mean, could be investment funds, hedge funds, or Chinese getting rich. I mean, could be a lot of reasons why demand for wheat went up. And there could be some climate and weather reasons why some of the supply went down. But there is no shortage. Meaning, shortage means the meaning, the definition of shortage is at the current prevailing price, buyers willing to pay the price cannot find it, cannot buy it. That's what shortage means, but there is no shortage with wheat. So that's the most important thing to understand about shortages. Uh, of course, similarly applies to surpluses. Surpluses can exist only if the government or some other institution on the market, well, will be properly non-market institution, sometimes could be just a court, which simply orders and fixes the price at a certain level, so surplus will be above the market clearing price. So, let's introduce the next concept of equilibrium. Equilibrium we call it also in economics market clearing. Market clearing. Market Market clearing. So, you have respectively market clearing price and respectively market clearing quantity. Market clearing is just the old English saying of equilibrium. So, you usually have the Latin type word and then have the Anglo Saxon type word. What does it mean the market to clear? It simply means that for the given price, there is no excess supply and there is no excess demand. It means that at the given price, sellers can sell everything they want to sell and buyers can buy everything they want to buy and there is no excess supply or demand. So this is an alternative concept. And finally we're getting to the law of supply and demand which are started and the law simply states that no matter where the market begins or no matter how the market is shocked soon enough it meaning the market will move back to its equilibrium price and we gotta find out simply why so, suppose market is shocked in here for some reason. Could be the government called it, could be something happened, a hurricane or whatnot, but in the end, this is the demand curve, and in the end, this is the supply curve, and that was the hurricane happened, but it didn't wipe out a bunch of crops. The price is here. The question is, why? the price will go down and move back to the equilibrium. Why would that actually occur? And here is the key. The key is called in economics or business the profit motive. The profit. The profit motive. If you are the business supplying the wheat or the oil or whatever you're supplying and you have an excess supply the excess supply brings no revenue excess supply means you have it you hold it and you can't sell it at the P1 price if you have it and you can't sell it at the P1 price there is zero revenue for any product, for any good, for any commodity, remember, if it's a good or if it's a commodity, and that's part of the definition in economics, it costs something. You sacrifice something to get it. So, no matter what you produce, if you're producing something, it has a particular cost. If it has a particular cost to you and you get a zero revenue, it must necessarily be the case that you're running a loss. 
Okay, that's simple as that. In other words, because if suppliers run a surplus and stick to the higher price, they are running a loss. The only way to reduce their loss, meaning to get some revenue, any revenue, whatever, is they must lower the price. So, you have the profit motive and you have the loss motive and your textbook uses the profit loss motive. So, sometimes it's called the profit loss Motive. So, the point here I'm making actually is that of the loss motive. Because at the higher price he will not be getting or realizing some sales and revenues will be zero. The supplier will be running losses. So, in order to reduce the losses, he will be lowering the price. Simple as that. So, whenever the price is above the market equilibrium, the loss motive will drive, in other words, to not sustain the run losses, will drive prices lower, and the opposite occurs here. A P2 price, meaning when the price is below the equilibrium price, they are getting too little, too low price. There are developing shortages. When customers are coming and there isn't enough of it, the profit motive will drive suppliers, respectively sellers, to raise the price. When they raise the price and there is that shortage, well, there is no shortage, but there is that shortage, they'll be able to sell at higher price. If they can sell at higher price, they can realize a higher profit. So, profit maximization, meaning the profit motive, will drive the price higher back to the equilibrium. All right, and we have five more minutes, right? All right, so for five more minutes, we complete this chapter with the, one of the most important observations in macroeconomics that you kind of uh, serve you for the rest of your lives because on it, is based an awful lot of propaganda and uh, again journalists just love to repeat this stuff over and over again even though it is perfectly incorrect and it's about inflation inflation first of all we have Uh, a number of definitions for inflation. So, we're talking here about price inflation. Price inflation. The most important thing to understand to get to the logic of price inflation is that, and here is the key, income is held or defined to be constant. So, if income is defined to be constant, then the only possible way from pure mathematics to increase the demand for one good, necessarily the demand for some other good must fall. Simple as that. In other words, if your income is 1,000, and you're spending it on A, B, and C, and A is non-negative, and B is non-negative, and C is non-negative, the only possible way to increase the demand for A is that either B or C or the demand for both B and C must necessarily fall. Simple as that. So, from this means that if you have increase in the price of A and B and C, in other words, you have a general 
price level, if the price of A increases, and the price of B increases, and the price of C increases, in other words, A general or macroeconomic price inflation, it must be the case that demand for A and B and C went up. So the key is, how is it possible for demand for all commodities to go up? How is this possible? And the answer is, it is possible in one and only one way. It is absolutely impossible when income is constant. So if these are rising, it must be the case that income is rising. But income may be rising for two different reasons. It may be rising because people produce more, or it may be rising because the government is printing more money. So, when you don't have any economic growth, or you have some, let's call it productivity growth, general inflation, meaning general price inflation, must be coming or caused by monetary inflation. That's the most important lesson. So, monetary inflation causes incomes to rise. So, if we have rising monetary inflation, it means that incomes rise and if incomes rise it must be the case that most if not all most of demand schedules so demand or let's just say aggregate demand demand schedules must go up and here is a key I don't really want to get into this detail today but if the government is printing faster than productivity grows, in other words, if they print at 10%, but we are able to increase the quantity supply, meaning to produce by 2 or 3%, the result must be an overall increase in prices. So, here is one of the, what journalists will repeat, I heard it, thousands of times so far is that rising oil prices cause inflation or drive overall prices higher. If oil prices go up, this means that everything that uses oil and energy goes up and you're told that higher oil prices rise or drive the whole inflation up. This is pure nonsense. This is typical garbage. Oil prices possibly rise because different governments are printing money and they are driving oil demand. What the logic is here is that it is true that if oil prices rise, possibly wheat and other agricultural prices, those that are energy intensive will rise, but house rents will fall, and let's say what else, cars and everything else which is not energy intensive itself, prices will fall, all right? So let's use some advanced macro intermediate macro terminology. If you have a supply shock, crude oil supply shock, meaning for some reason oil gets scarcer and it prices go up, it does not cause inflation the government will attempt to counter the shock. It will attempt to absorb the shock by printing more money to stimulate the economy. In other words, if the government does not react back to the oil shock, the shock will drive the economy into a recession and the recession, temporary recession, maybe for a year or two, will be the adjustment of the economy. The government will not be willing to allow this one or two year recession. So they try to print money and provide a monetary and possibly even a fiscal stimulus. And that monetary and fiscal stimulus will cause prices to increase. So it is not that oil prices went up 
to cause overall price level to go up. But the prices went up, it drove the government to monetary, expansionary monetary policy, which in turn resulted to higher prices. And that's extremely important to remember for the rest of your lives. This is good enough for today? All right, guys, let's turn it off. We'll show up. Let's see who's in class. Uh, if you guys pass by the camera, say hello to your camera, okay? <laughs> These guys are taking care of you.